Okay, good, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Hans de Goede and uh, I am a software engineer working for Red Hat. On a mother, um, uh, among other things, I'm working for the X server, so of course we couldn't get the Beamer to work. <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, this uh, kind gentleman in the front uh, borrowed me his laptop, thank you. Uh, in my spare time I work on U-Boot and kernel for all winner uh, uh, SOCs, all winner ARM SOCs, which are used in uh, budget uh, ARM tablets mostly. And uh, that's what my talk today uh, is about. Specifically, it's about uh, hardware auto configuration. And then specifically hardware auto configuration on uh, Q8, tab Q8 tablets. I'll quickly introduce what a Q8 tablet is and then what, what the problems are with these devices, why we cannot just have a single device tree to, to use them all. Then I'll look a bit in hardware auto configuration in general. And after that, uh, a conclusion, and then there will be a lot of uh, time for questions and answers. Because uh, my presentation isn't that long, and I hope that this is a topic which will lead to some interesting discussion. So, uh, Q8 tablets. Are uh, very cheap 7-inch tablets, like this one. This one is currently running GNOME 3, but it's using software rendering, so it's sort of working, but not really. <laughs> uh, but these devices can be had for $40. They contain for $40 nowadays, if you buy the, the current generation, they contain a quad-core processor. And uh, the sheet says half a gig of RAM, but they actually have a gig of RAM now, which is good, because half a gig of RAM can be a bit constraining. Uh, so the latest, latest models have a gig of RAM if you look carefully and for $40, quad-core, gig of RAM, LCD display actually, battery, Wi-Fi, things like that. It's, it's, it's a really nice device for $40. But you, you get what you pay for, right? So you, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the problem is that since these devices are made for only one reason, and that is to be cheap, and if you buy a tablet and two weeks later you buy the same tablet, the internals are going to be different. There will be a different batch of accelerometers in there, different touchscreen controller, different Wi-Fi chip, things like that. So the question is, since I want end users to be able to run plain Linux on these devices, I've been working on that for the last couple of years, uh, which I want to discuss with you today is, is, is it possible to get these tablets, I have 16 of them at home, I have one with me, <laughs> 16 different models, is it possible <coughs> to get these tablets to run uh, upstream Linux kernel using a single device tree for each SOC family? So there are three SOC families, the single core, dual core, quad core, those, of course, need a different device tree because it's an entirely different SOC. But is it possible if the user picks the right SOC because he knows which SOC he has to auto-detect the other things, the accelerometer, the touchscreen mostly? Uh, so onto the touchscreen. The touchscreen actually is the biggest problem. There are four models of touchscreen, which I've seen in the 16 models I have. Two revisions of the uh, Silent GSL1680 controller. Uh, those are the nasty ones because those are in almost all the tablets, but they're not wired up the same in all the tablets, to make things interesting. Uh, and then there's the Elan uh, and the Zytec, which are only found in one tablet I have. So they are sort of easy because if they're there, then I know which firmware file to load and things like that. Uh, so detecting which of the four models is present is actually easy. You just uh, bit bang the I2C bus, and if something is listening at an address, then you can read an ID register on most models. And if that matches, then you're probably talking to that touchscreen, <laughs> probably, hopefully. And the GSL1680 uh, actually has uh, a revision register, so I also know which revision I have. So those parts are covered and are easy, but the hard parts are as I already sort of said, that the, the Silite GSL1680 uh, is uh, a very flexible little chip. It's found in 14 of the 16 tablets I have access to, and it has configurable pin boxing. It doesn't just have pins like X1, X2, X3, X4 for the horizontal uh, detection and then for the vertical detection pins numbered I1. It just has a number of input pins, and they can wire them up whatever is convenient when they're routing the PCB and then fix it up in the firmware the routing, <laughs> which means that even you have the, the exact same digitizer, you can swap the digitizer in these tablets, the digitizer is like three dollars, so I have bought a number of them second hand and just put in a new digitizer because the screen was correct. Uh, the digitizers are all the same, the chip is the same everywhere, but still there is a lot of variance between tablets because of the pin muxing thing. So I need different firmware files because the pin muxing is part of the firmware and we have no clue what's inside the firmware, it's a blob. Uh, 
even if you have the firmware file right, some firmware files have uh, the XI coordinate swapped on some models. So then they actually have hooked up all the pins the same, but they have numbered them mirrored. And uh, another thing is that the resolution which the device reports is part of the firmware setup. It's, it does some scaling in firmware too. For some reason, uh, a lot of these devices on, on, on Android actually try to make the touchscreen coordinates match one-on-one -on -one with the uh, display resolution. Even though there's no technical reason for it. Maybe Android at one point required that, or for some reason they're scaling whatever native resolution they have to the display resolution. So that, that's all uh, things, which means that uh, on each tablet, the, the touchscreen node in device tree pretty much needs to look different. Which also means that, to jump ahead a bit, that device tree overlays are sort of out of the picture because you get such an explosion of combinations with the, the X inversion, the I inversion, the firmware file, the resolution, uh, XI uh, access swapping is also happening. XY. So, um, yeah, we got a lot of combinations, so using device free overlay is not really an answer here. Uh, so the touchscreen illusion is that uh, actually I've just been trying firmware files from one tablet on other tablets, and I can bring the, the, the variation in firmware files down to two per revision. Unfortunately, not one, so I still need to figure out which firmware file I need to load on a single revision. And uh, so far, on the 16 models I have access to, I, I have a little heuristics where I look at the accelerometer and the Wi-Fi chip which is present, <laughs> and then I, I, I pick a firmware file and if I need to swap or not. And of course, there is no correlation between, or no causation between the two, right? They can, they can easily put another accelerometer on there and my heuristics will no longer work. But for now, I have everything running on all 16 models without uh, needing any override on the command line. I do lock all the settings I detect and all the choices I make, and there are uh, kernel command line options to override them for users. But so far I'm getting away, at least on 16 models, with not needing to use those command line options by using heuristics based on other bits of the tablet. Other completely unrelated bits, which happen to have some correlation. Um, the accelerometer. The accelerometer is interesting in that I almost have 16 different accelerometers in the 16 different tablets I have. <laughs> almost. I ended up writing uh, three IIIO ac accelerometer drivers for this. They are they're being upstreamed currently. Uh, again, detected by just poking the I2C bus. So just, well, you know the addresses they listen at. Some can listen at multiple addresses depending on some pins which are pulled up or pulled down. So you need to try them at multiple addresses. Uh, a problem with the accelerometer chips is orientation because they can either be on the top side of the PCB or the bottom side, and then they can be rotated. Uh, so far, it seems that most of them, but that's also because I only have a few which are used in more than one tablet, are used with a fixed orientation. I still need to add support for that. There is actually already a device tree standard for IIO devices to, to uh, tell how the, how, how the sensor is oriented versus how it would normally be if it was mounted exactly the right way. Um, and yeah, so we can just, but basically for almost all tablets I have, uh, I can just use a fixed orientation. There is one sensor, I think the last one, the MXC6225, which is mounted different on two tablets I have, but there I can sort of do the reverse. I can use the touchscreen to determine the <laughs> accelerometer <laughs> orientation. <laughs> so yeah, this, this was a fun little project. Uh, and the end result is this, on one tablet, that I'm not sure if it's really, we can, Zoom in a bit more, I guess. So this is the D-Mesh on, uh, on one of those ta these tablets, and this is my Q8 hardware manager, which is said I basically says I'm looking for a touchscreen without a regulator. Oh, that's also a thing. Uh, some of the touchscreens are powered by a separate regulator. So if I'm probing the touchscreen, I'm doing two rounds. First, I'm looking for a touchscreen without powering up the regulator, and then if I'm not finding anything, I'm powering up the regulator and then <laughs> doing an, a, a second round. Uh, well, it basically, here you see just that it's pretty chatty, but that's because, well, it might be wrong. <laughs> so it's trying to give the end user info and some hints, like try using these command line, kernel command line options to, to fix things. And well, this code is pretty much ready for upstreaming now. I just haven't got around to submit it upstream yet. Although I have submitted an RFC version and I had to change the device tree bindings a bit, but a little bit more on that later. Um, now I need to zoom out again. So uh, hopefully more interesting for you is what does this 
toying around with Chinese tablets, I have been doing mean for hardware auto configuration in general. Well, for one, it's possible. Right? If I can do it without any control of the hardware, then if you have some control of, your, of the hardware, you can talk to your hardware division internally, hopefully, then uh, it's definitely possible to deal with multiple board revisions with a single device tree file. And I also think that that needs to be the way forward because uh, Nowadays, you see a lot of second sourcing, especially if uh, products are made in, in bigger series and things like that. So you really need to, to, to stop thinking about a single static device tree for a single board, because with board revisions or even the same revision where a chip has been swapped for a second source, you need to adjust to that. And that's also what I hope we can have some discussion about. So as I said before, I probably won't be filling my time. Uh, general hardware auto configuration. I hope that you have some control over the hardware that you have are working with a product which is designed in-house. And I strongly advise you to start talking to your hardware division as early as possible and really tell them we need some sane way, not what I'm doing on the QA tablets, some sane way to uniquely identify the hardware and if chips have been swapped for second sources, which chips have been swapped, etc. So probably there will need to be a, a small EEPROM on there and someone is going to complain that that uh, brings up your bill of materials, right? That's going to cost money, but you just really need that to do this properly without crazy stuff. You c if you have a lot of GPIOs free, you can do something with GPIOs, right? You can, something like that. But an EEPROM gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, so um, I actually said it's, uh, or, uh, so tips are make sure you can identify the hardware, but not just that you can identify the hardware, but also that you can get the revision of the board. And again, if it's possible to swap chips on a revision also that you can get that kind of info. If there are add-ons, so if you look at the BeagleBone, which uh, Pontellis has been working on and his, uh, his work has been a great help for me, I pretty much, the device tree site was done. <laughs> I just needed to use his code. Um, then uh, you really also want a way to enumerate the add-ons. And again, you want to be able to get a revision and things like that. You just, uh, we, uh, we in the embedded world, we in the ARM world, device world need to stop thinking static. I think that that's a mistake that everyone is still thinking that hardware is static. Hardware is not static. If you look at how people are using development boards like the Raspberry Pi, what they're, they're piling on and the chip also has its own extension bus and things like that. We really should stop thinking as device tree as a static thing. It's not, not anymore, not in reality. So, well, if you're not in control of the hardware, then good luck. Right, hopefully you can do something creative as I did. Uh, so, applying the device tree changes. I already talked a bit about this. If you have add-ons, right, so you have like a development board and you have certain um, boards which you can stack on top, then usually you can have a device tree overlay per board, right? So you have some device tree overlay manager which identifies I have this, this add-on stacked on top via some detection mechanism and then you can just apply that. So device tree overlays are good for that, but device tree overlays are very static. So it's also possible, uh, and I did that because of all the different touchscreen things I needed to deal with, uh, it's also possible to actually just generate sort of a patch to apply to the device tree in C code, which is actually really nice. And it's, it's easiest to just show that in code. So here's a small, small snippet of code. Basically, you declare a struct, which is called a an uh, open firmware change set. Uh, well, in this case, I also declare a device node pointer because uh, I need to apply the changes on top of something. Then I, in my case, I use uh, find node by name. That's actually interesting because I started with adding a specific compatible to say like this is a special Q8 hardware managed node. And then uh, the device tree uh, uh, maintainers, one of the device tree maintainers, Rob basically said like, no, 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 because you're not describing hardware, you're describing software, just. So, so, so I ended up using uh, find node by name. Normally that's actually sort of frowned upon, but in this case it feels like the right thing to do. So I'm just going by the board compatible, and if the board compatible says it's a Q8 tablet, then my hardware manager will initialize and it will try to find. I'm using template nodes. So I have a template device tree node for the touchscreen, which is basically empty. The most important rule of it is that it's below an I2C bus. So it will tell me which I2C bus I need to use for probing. Because luckily, at least, they always use the same I2C bus for the touchscreen and the same I2C bus for the accelerometer. That, that bit is fixed. I don't need to walk all the I2C buses. 
and then you just get, you need to change that. I add a property, uh, an integer property and a string property. In this case, I also change a string property. I'm updating the status property so that the node actually gets enabled. And then this code, in which Pantanos has done a lot of work on, I assume, under the hood, does a shitload of stuff and it dynamically up, uh, generates the new platform, struct platform device and registers it with the platform bus and everything, or I squared C bus in my case, and everything just happens. Which is great. And of course, don't forget to free your resources. But. So this is basically the, the, the non-overlay side. I don't know how the, the overlay API in the kernel actually looks because I haven't used it, but I'm sure it it's, shouldn't be that hard to use either. Yeah. Yeah, but you're 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 not. If you are doing an overlay manager in the kernel, you're not directly calling these functions, right? You're just loading the overlay, and it's generating a change set from the overlay, and then you apply it. So conclusion, as I said, I won't be talking long. I'm hoping for some discussion. Uh, well, I started with the question: Is it possible to dynamically adjust a single device tree file per SOC family for this tablet? So far, yes, it seems to be possible. It's a bit hackish, but it works. Uh, do's and don'ts learned. Uh, do start thinking about this while you're designing your hardware, and then I'm repeating myself. Do not leave it till after the hardware is complete, which is saying the same thing again because it's important. <laughs> really, it's something which if you won't need to take anything home from this talk, it's uh, you're probably going to have to deal with hardware revisions during the lifetime of a product, and you really want to be able to detect that. Any changes you want to be able to detect them in the same way. Uh, so yeah, do make sure your hardware revision variants are easily uniquely identifiable. And one thing which I learned is don't add a node to the device tree to represent your hardware manager because the device tree managers don't, uh, device tree maintainers don't like it because device tree is meant to describe hardware. So what you can do, what I did, is that you, you trigger the activation of the manager based on the board string or the board compatible or the model string. And that's pretty much it. So, yeah, only 20 minutes. Sorry. And as I said, I hope we'll have some good discussions. Yeah, go. Because device tree, if you have a simple bus instantiates platform devices, that's how it works. But you could just create a platform device and go back to platform device I could, in theory, create my I squared C client, except that my drivers have a device tree binding, so they expect to find things like which firmware file to load, which resolution, etc., in the device tree. Uh, I don't think they're respinning their kernel. I think they're respinning their entire firmware image. I mean, this is just they 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 just they they go to the Schengen market. They see which which real width accelerometer chips they can buy. If, if you actually if you look at the PCBs, there are like three or four footprints for the accelerometer. So they can decide the moment they start uh, pick and placing which accelerometer they're going to throw on there. Um, well, sort of, yes. Sorry, what? Yes. I know that the device tree maintainers are sort of accepting that I'm doing this, but they're not really happy. They would like to see some sort of generic hardware manager. So maybe we will get a generic binding that if you're smart enough to put an EE prom in there, you can. You, we also have to have a mechanism called device tree quirks. I'm not sure what the upstream status of that is. <laughs> uh, so, so, so what could be is that you start using quirks and then we get a generic mechanism and you can just declare an EEPROM as this contains your quirk info or whatever and then. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, 
It's a very interesting discussion, but I don't want to see bytecode in the device tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, especially for me since I'm the the, the all winner U-boot maintainer, so I can just just sneak it in. It but like <laughs> a special place because you, you can you can you have also infrastructure U-boot to easily catch up the team there, and that's already done in terms of the memory. And <coughs> and that's that's yeah, that's that's but then you're bound you're pushing the bootloader to the yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, the, the, each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did that for this place. I put in all the display systems and detect, and then I, I call it like a Schrodinger and test solution. You don't know which one. This is Schrodinger and Schrodinger. And I put uh, OK on that note, which is uh, an, an order yeah. this. And uh, it was nice, because um, the, the maintainers don't like it. They don't want the stuff that's not actually in the system in the device tree. Uh, which, which maintainer uh, next, at Linux? Uh, FP that maintainer. Thing you, you, you can you can either use for instance for PCI Express you can either configure it as, as, as a PCI Express 5.4 5 or just use the lanes yeah. uh, so you've always some NL and some disable properties so you can uh, so and, and where's the difference where to draw the line so, so uh, yeah but uh, that's that's not something which you hopefully not something which you're changing on board provision right so that's just fixed for a specific board you should but but Concerning the, the enable and disable discussion, so it's just if you have that that display, you can't have the other one. So it's the same thing. If you think about the, the lane mm -hmm. PCI Express, you can only have X4 or you have the yes. same lane. So if you think, okay, you have this display and you can't have the other, so it's but the same. Maybe yeah. better the number of combinations, right? So the PCI lanes, there are only it's a natural thing. You have only a few, but display there could be like it's totally independent. Yeah. That's because to I mean, it, it ACPI uses it all the same. So it has also enable and disable bits, and um, the biases are very generic, basically, and for instance, support a number of CPUs and enable and disable. But it's, but it's for very specific uh, hardware parts and not yeah. for something general. Yeah, that's, that, that's to answer your question specifically why I didn't choose to do that for, for, for these tablets is that uh, I have this combinational, combinational explosion going on with the touchscreen, right? I have uh, the firmware file, and then I have, is I, I, Y X inverted, is X X inverted. So uh, right now I have 16 tablets, but each time I buy a new tablet, I, I, I get a new combination. So it's basically the same reason why I'm not using device tree overlays, because then I would need to generate device tree overlays for all possible combinations of, is the X X inverted, is the Y X inverted, are the Xs swapped? So you, you get this combinational explosion, and then just doing it dynamically is so much easier. Yeah, but, but, but I would, I would, uh, I mean, not this, uh, I would distinguish base from code. So I would, a snippet to, to any, <coughs> I would not do all No, but the problem is, I, I, I have like, say, let's say I make a single note for the GSL 1680 revision A, then uh, in that note, I need to set a firmware file name, and I'm actually allowing to set a, random firmware file name on the kernel command line, because if, if, if a new tablet with new firmware files up, the user can extract it and can drop it and can just override the, the firmware file name on the command line. So that's already sort of makes device tree overlay and fixed nodes not work, because the user can pick any random ASCII string, so I would to need to generate pre-entries for all possible ASCII strings, <laughs> which are a lot. And we have the same thing for resolution. Uh, if a new firmware shows up, it may have a random, uh, uh, another resolution that I support, so I would need to sort of make a list of all possible resolutions, and it get multiplied, right? If I have fixed nodes, which I only enable or disable, I get number of possible firmware names times mul number of mul multiple resolutions times X inversions, which is two times. So the combinational explosion is just not manageable. Is there a difference? If we would be a perfect world and the manufacturer would have added the EEPROM you requested, and handling all the uh, variants, how would you do that? Probably still the same, because well, and the, the EEPROM could then contain a device tree overlay in an ideal world. Assuming that device tree really is the perfect ABI we all want it to be, but which it really isn't. Or if you didn't have the device tree overlay in the EEPROM, you could just pick the information from the EEPROM and assemble it yourself, right, and compile it. And yeah, but if you're already picking and compiling, then why, go, why first compile it into a device tree overlay and then have the overlay manager apply it? Why not just directly apply the changes to the device tree? You're only adding complexity and code, and you need some temporary storage somewhere. And avoiding adding stuff into the kernel, adding code into the kernel. Well, no, I still have the code, but the code now generates a device tree file, a device tree overlay. Yeah, that's running in user space. Yeah. Oh. Well. It, it could, unless I need 
uh, to do this before I have access to user space for some reason, right? Yeah, so no, I think the more interesting question would be why not do it in U-Boot or in a bootloader? But that also depends on how much control you have over your bootloader. Uh, I tried all the approaches. I did first what you said. I got that Mac. And I, then I did this with you, Joe. And that, that was Mac as well. <laughs> and uh, then this one suggested that they do it from user space. But it's, the, it's the, the freaking console. I don't get the console until I have user space. <laughs> <laughs> Then, if you then do, do it in U-Boot, and then wh what about the people that don't run U-Boot? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. But So I have a feeling that one of the, the, the biggest hot topics here is, uh, I think we all agree that we need to do something where we adjust the device tree. The, the, I, I'm hearing some people say, do it in user space, do it in the kernel, do it in the bootloader. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I have the feeling that if I submit this patch set, you're going to knack it. <laughs> and that I need to I need to move it to U-boot basically. No, no, no. It's 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 it's. Not entirely. I agree. I see for that. Can we build something of that we say, okay, please take a look at this I2C bus on on this address and figure out the rest. Well, no. Then you would also need to say and check this register if it has this value and if it masks with this mask if it then contains this value because. The n yeah, for one, not, not all I2C chips have an identification register. It's something which vendors decide to put in there. It's not part of any standard. Actually, not all I2C uh, devices have the same protocol to get to a register, right? I2C just has either you're writing data and it's a write stream or it's a read stream. So normally to get to a register, you need to first write an address and then end the write stream and start a read stream. And even that part is not standardized, how you get to a <laughs> register. That can be vendor specific. Nicely with I2C, EEPROMs, with a lot of 
qualified to teach EPIO expanders. Um, there's some boards I work with. Uh, um, I've thought about ge trying to generalize the, um, the, the board ID reading in roughly the way you're describing. Um, and it, yeah, but it <coughs> just basically say pattern match all this, so that it, you end up with a scripting language. say on, uh, on this board I know that I can identify by reading this I, this IGC address on this bus in this format and here's what the data looks like and then you have a way of mapping that to DT overlay or something. So you can code, code that back in, in the uh, yeah. board? Yeah, uh, use this enumeration mechanism and then we've got a, and then the code actually goes and does the read and decides oh yes this matches this thing in the table that would be the data about exactly how you read and what you read would be. Okay so why don't we Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. You need to look at him. I think what he said is you tag it on to the end of the DTP, so yeah, the yeah. bootloader would know it has to be different. Nothing. Yeah, but it's not very smart. we're talking about, well, I would have to take a look, I'm afraid now, but... <laughs> Yes, but if they know that there's a set of devices that you have, you could actually say, 
this with the same radar, it's not a problem, is if you have a, a yeah, but that's what device system. Right. Do you have to modify it <coughs> to divert for all the possible uh, Yeah, uh, and, and you're... Not only because it's a system, but code, it's just that the device driver can attach it to another one. Yeah, no, but you're also hitting the problem there. For example, there's one, one of those accelerometers. It actually has an I2C echo on an address which is shifted by one. And if you do anything to that, to that I2C echo, then the bus is dead. <laughs> you're, you're, you're underestimating how bad hardware is. <laughs> Any more questions, discussion items? Sure. So, so we, you know, um, for a lot of our EVMs, do run into kind of a similar problem, especially for different board rev. And I guess the problem that we have is now you're kind of coupling, you know, when you start doing a lot of this dynamic editing of the device tree, now you're really just coupling, you know, either you do it in the kernel or you do it in a bootloader, but you're really coupling the code with the actual conversion of the DTB. So how do you handle, you know, having old versions or new versions of the DTB that you have to go in and dynamically modify for them? Well, the live ones are stable, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that, that's the official answer. Uh, the, uh, the unofficial answer is that at least for, for all winner devices, we, we luckily don't have, although there are plans, any devices yet which actually come with a DTB burnt into the firmware. So we always uh, load DTB from the same medium as the kernel, and they get updated in sync, basically. So although we try to keep the ABI stable, if we accidentally break it, it doesn't really matter because it will... Basically, we have a version DTB directory and then a version kernel image, and they get matched in the, in the bootloader config. So it will also pick the DTB as shipped with that kernel, which is actually also a good reason why uh, to do it in the kernel, by the way, the whole... Yes.
Yeah, but That's a good one, yes. which is not very dynamic. Yeah, that was, by the way, another way to do the hardware management in the kernel because people tend to burn the bootloader once and then be happy the board boots. Mm -hmm. And you want to update this for newer revisions of boards and things like that. That's a good one. Well, it's That's a reason not to do it in the bootloader. It's not necessarily a reason to do it in the kernel. <laughs> it's a reason to do it post-bootloader. Yeah. yeah. So user space would still be an option. Uh, as with the pre-kernel shim thing. <laughs> But so you get your bootloader to boot something which does the hardware auto detect and then modifies the DDB and then boots the real kernel? <coughs> So we have one more question here at the front. 